Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here in the inspiration stage uh, after lunch, which is uh, <laughs> good to have you here. So today we're going to talk about the digital era of uh, art and the NFTs. Um, and we're going to touch it through different uh, sides, the te technological, the artistical, and the social part. Uh, I'm Sabrina Bonini. I'm the founder of Crypto Escultura, which is an initiative uh, that helps, is trying to help uh, creators and artists and brands and um, uh, businesses to get into the NFT space um, and do it with success. Um, and I wanted to introduce a little bit the panelists, and then I'm going to let them talk a bit more about what they're doing. So we have uh, Ricardo Carretero next to me. Uh, he's a game and product designer. He's the founder and CEO of Gamified Systems, a design agency helping gamify products and services and helping game companies to design <coughs> their games in scalable ways. We have Maria Revelo, uh, director of uh, business development of Eureka, a blockchain company that provides IP validation for NFTs and thus continuous surveillance and evaluation of the market. Very important. <laughs> um, she also acts as an active member of the European Union by supporting NGOs in projects for the research, social inclusion, and digital development. Then we have uh, Hasmuk Keray from the team at La De Viure de Fundació Ampans. Uh, it's an organization that has for more than 50 years worked to promote quality of life, uh, education and employment of people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, and then we have uh, Ben Baldieri, Chief Community Officer for VJ Arts, a carbon negative traditional artist marketplace that leverages NFTs for social good. So uh, maybe we can start with you to introduce yourself a little bit more and talk about what you're currently doing. Okay, thank you, Sabrina, for the introduction. Um, my name is Ricardo, and I have been into the gaming industry for like 20 years. As some of you probably know, NFTs and gaming get on quite well together uh, because basically I have my work has been selling digital assets for a long time before crypto and NFTs, and now I'm transitioning to helping companies that want to uh, make games with NFTs, doing so in a sustainable manner, not bubbles, not pyramid, these kind of things. And also helping other products like Agora to get uh, this gamification effect to, to make, for example, voting fun. And that's my relevant experience to explain here. All right, thank you. And thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. So my name is Maria. I'm originally from Portugal, but I'm actually an expat in Barcelona. And as Sabrina mentioned, I work uh, for Eureka. I'm a business developer. Uh, and what we provide is decentralized solutions for the protection of intellectual property for digital assets. So for NFTs or digital assets as well, this uh, connected to NFTs connected to physical paintings. My background is in marketing and advertising, and I worked, well, since I'm 13 years old, with NGOs and foundations for the European Union, mainly on the topics of social inclusion and as well on the technological inclusion. So it's a pleasure to be here and to meet you all. My name is Hasmuk. Um, feel free to call me Has for the rest of the session. Um, I'm originally from London, but I've been living in Manresa and Barcelona for the last nine years. Uh, the adventures brought me to Fundacion Pans, where it's probably the greatest project that I've been ha having the fortune to be able to contribute to. Um, as Sabrina mentioned, it's a project that works to promote uh, social value and the inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities in society. And um, one of the many projects run by the foundation is uh, Art de Viuda, the, um, the main protagonist of the exhibition you see at the other side of the room. Awesome. Uh, my name is Ben Baldieri. Some of you may have seen me this morning on the uh, Web3 and Blockchain Education panel. Now I put on a different hat for a different project that I'm involved with. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Chief Community Officer for VJ Arts, 
Vijay is working with traditional artists, so those who paint, those involved in sculpture, photography, to digitize their work and then get them more involved in the art space. And then instead of the kind of traditional marketplace model with all of the fees going to the marketplace, some of it goes into a solidarity wallet, which is then being used to fund real world um, art projects, charity initiatives, again, on that social inclusion front, we're doing some, some really cool uh, work with some projects in Morocco, tokenizing intangible cultural heritage in Ukraine and stuff like that. So it's an yeah, exciting place to be at the moment. Thank you. Thank you all. Super interesting uh, backgrounds and, and things you're doing. So I think we can all agree here that NFTs are truly revolutionary. They're allowing for, uh, for, for the rise of the creator's economy. Um, and it's given you know, new forms of capitalization and cooperation uh, to artists and, and, and organizations, etc. Um, I, I always like to say that they're giving uh, artists and art their value back because, well, um, it's always been difficult for, for artists to monetize. Um, and one of the things that really interested me uh, when I learned about NFTs is how they're allowing artists uh, from, you know, uh, all over the world and no matter the background or where they are to actually get to a lot of people that before wouldn't be able to and to be able to monetize their work. So I wanted to ask you guys what's your experience in that regard and how are NFTs uh, uh, helping artists and creators all around the world in, in your different um, areas? I can start with you. Okay. <coughs> Um, I can talk from two different perspectives on the, of the NFTs, the, the gaming side and the non-gaming side. Uh, the NFTs have erupted into the gaming space in a very interesting way. Basically, the main change that they have produced is that if you are playing a game and have this magical hat that is super cool, or you're playing Fortnite and you have this skin, you buy it, you keep it, that's it. And now with crypto technology, now you earn or you buy this scheme from other player. So there is suddenly it's not like a one-one relationship like developer player. It's a developer and there is a market of players trading among themselves. That's quite revolutionary for the gaming. And there are ways to do it better, worse, etc. So that's one angle. But the other one is the, the from the product in Agora, for example, uh, Agora is a platform which allows everyone to upload their pictures, short films, songs, artistic digital creations, even paintings. You take a picture of the painting. People vote, and the winner gets access to the uh, NFT market. Um, not everybody. So we are different than OpenSea and so on, uh, in the sense that not everybody can access it. So the value of these NFTs, which is a big conversation, why people should buy this NFT? What's the value of this? What's the utility? Well. If 200,000 people vote for it, there's, there should be valuable, you know, and that's the value of it. So very interesting approaches, and I think the best projects in the NFT space are being developed right now. Nothing that we have seen, we have seen a lot, but the coolest thing is still to come, I think. What do you like? I agree with that, mm -hmm. but the technology is definitely developing. Um, I think my first realization with the power of NFTs uh, was the moment I realized that NFTs are just a technology, uh, but they're also an ecosystem that we as human beings and social beings created uh, for ourselves. And it became very inclusive in the matter of since late 2020, was, which is when I started working with NFTs and NFT artists, I saw so many artists that I would never imagine seeing in a gallery being in a well-curated gallery such as Super Rare or No Norwich in our foundation. And why is that? I was speaking to artists from on Clubhouse, if anyone knows, is the old Twitter spaces. Um, and I was talking to artists from villages that I had no clue where it was. They had to show me, I had to, sh to search on the map in order to understand where they're coming from. How are they making so much money? So the traditional space, was for artists very hard. It really required opportunity and luck. And today, we see that this opportunity and luck is way more inclusive. 
So artists can really bring together and even collaborate with artists from all over the world in order to, to make an experience for us, the, the consumers, the buyers, the collectors. And that was one of the first realizations that I had. While working at Eureka, um, the main experience I had is that NFTs allow artists to pursue collectors and pursue uh, this vision of uh, you know, having their work being shown and giving something to, to the people that look at it, mainly in through, through public spaces, uh, from all over the world, while feeling that they were protecting and they were protected. Uh, because what we do is we provide this validation. So an artist comes to us with a piece of art or even a collector that wants to buy a piece of art and they need this licensing, this proof that is not just the proof of ownership, uh, but it's actually a proof of originality or provenance, as you'd call it. And so to, to enter a space where there's not just this hype and this mm, being in the middle of the jungle feeling like it was in 2021 uh, is very, very grateful. I'm very grateful for it. Uh, I can resonate a lot with what uh, Maria just explained because um, moving a bit further away from the technological side, I think NFTs help artists and especially the artists that are the builder. Um, art is very subjective and what NFTs, I think, has provided, at least from our experience, is the reaffirmation of uh, the self-belief in your own art um, to not pursue the instant gratification that Web2 platforms have promoted and creating just for engagement and likes. And um, I've seen that on Web3 and NFTs, people have gone back to creating pieces that are truer to themselves and when that art is supported in the NFT space that is very reassuring for an artist and just in the creation of the exhibition here there was a huge excitement and in the interest that and the opportunity to be in a space like this so that self-confidence that an artist can get from that opportunity I think is very powerful. Yeah, and I think to, to add to that as well the the inclusive aspect of NFTs is the interesting thing because the I think my understanding is limited. I'm not from the traditional art world, but the, the perception is to make it big in the traditional art world, to get into the right galleries and meet the right people, the right backers, that sort of thing. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you have to have the right connections. You have to be in the right place at the right time, producing the right thing. Um, and that's not easy. If you're someone who's living in like one of the art capitals of the world, like London or New York or something, then your chances increase. But if you're somewhere else, your chances of doing that are greatly limited. And I think NFTs are super interesting because they drop that barrier by giving digital artists, which is where we've seen kind of this initial explosion. Digital artists have done incredibly well over the course of the past year because they now have a way of verifiably distributing their work. So like there's the, the right click save as meme. That is something that people can still do, but now they can sell their work, they can verify that they produced it, they are receiving royalties for it, which is, again, it's an absolute game changer. Now, we're starting, I'm starting to see, and what we're doing with the platform is moving back towards traditional artists, so working with physical media as opposed to digital media, working with them to digitize their work and then provide the digital channel as another way of generating a following, another way of building a community around their work. And the really cool thing about that is anything physical could potentially be tokenized. And this could be for charitable purposes. For example, uh, what Haz is doing with, the, with these NFTs at the moment. It's a fantastic example. With VJ, we're doing a similar sort of thing with a uh, foundation that was established in Morocco with the help of a Swiss guy. Um, Half of his fortune went into it. I mean, he's Swiss, so obviously there's plenty of money to go around, right? Um, and he's created this foundation called Atlas Children. And one of the big social issues in Morocco is arranged marriages. Nothing wrong with an arranged marriage, depending on your cultural perspective. But what can sometimes happen is the wife-to-be ends up pregnant. The husband-to-be abandons the wife. The wife has the child. 
massive amounts of shame for the family and the child ends up being abandoned. So what Atlas Children is, takes these children in, gives them an education, gives them somewhere to live, and they do a lot of work with art. So we're going to be working with them to tokenize that artwork that these children are producing, selling the artwork, and then that revenue that is generated from that goes back into the foundation to be able to expand. And similar things are going on um, in Asia, working with Montessori Group to tokenize some of the work that the children are producing there as well, um, similar in Vietnam, similar in the Philippines at the moment. And these are all places that if you were a traditional artist or you were just looking to start out and you were looking to make it big in the art world and you didn't have the right connections or backers or what have you, your chance are limited. But now we can drop that barrier and then ultimately give something back as well. Yeah, so NFTs are not only impacting artists, but it's, only Im it's also impacting you know, social causes and, and people. Um, and it's really interesting what you were just uh, what you, you were just saying. I was going to ask about that, but maybe we can go with you, Has, and talk a bit more about uh, Lar de Viure and, and and the project that Ampans is uh, doing with uh, with these people, Kay. and uh, then talk a bit a, bi a bit about the the exhibition. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present the project here. Um, I'll try to be brief because, uh, as my colleagues here will say with me that Ampans is a very mm, widely expansive project, but it all started, we can say, around 50 years ago when a group of parents in a town called Manresa, about an hour away from here, um, realized that their kids were, were in need of support with the different uh, mental health issues and disabilities, and they basically created a support group amongst themselves to help their kids. Uh, and as their kids grew older, they realized that it, in the traditional school system, they wouldn't get the support that they needed. So with the creation of Fundacion Pans, uh, there was a creation of a special needs school in the area, which was the first of its kind in the area. Then these kids were growing older. They, uh, some of them needed full support services, so they could, the Ampans provides care homes. But there were some who um, still had the ability to find a place to work, so Ampans then provided professional training programs and then also work placement programs and its own businesses where people with different um, backgrounds can work in a safe environment without the risks, um, firstly for the worker and for the family and secondly for a traditional company who might not want to take that risk on, on hiring somebody um, with different um, mental backgrounds. And these businesses range from a cheese factory, a garden center, so that they can work and also experience the day-to-day -day benefits of working in, with the therapeutic advantage of working with plants, uh, restaurants. And so there's a huge range of, of uh, services um, that Ampans provides. And one of the projects within this plethora of them is a project called Arde Viuda. Arde Viuda was... Um, born to promote the self-esteem and emotional stability of those with uh, intellectual disabilities and to provide a state of um, healthy physical and mental balance. Um, if anybody here has experience in uh, artistic creations, you also find that when you're painting or you're illustrating something, it's um, a moment to relax, it's a moment to release tension and that's what the artists at Art the Viola can experience with the aid of professionals who are trained uh, both in social care and also in um, artistic disciplines. And with the professional help, they are given a space to learn and develop artistic techniques, uh, different styles, and then be given the opportunity to have these artworks uh, recognized and respected um, by society. Um, so that can be in uh, participating in different contests, um, in different exhibitions, and for the first time in, in Ampan's history in the, in the digital NFT exhibition. It's really, really interesting. Mm. And I wanted to, to take the, the excuse <laughs> to remind you that we have the exhibition and the pieces are on sale. Um, so they are in an, in a, um, in a marketplace called Doing Good, which you can have a wallet or you can just pay with a card and all proceeds are going to, to keep helping uh, Lar de Viure and, mm. and Ampas work. So please do go and, and have a look there, just right there. Um, so moving towards more the technology side and, and how that is impacting, um, I want to talk more about the impact in the creation of art itself. 
um, how uh, it allows NFTs allow to to new forms of creation. Now, uh, code is a tool for for artists, um, and how that is impacting the the artistic world. No, um, so maybe Maria, we can go with you. Um, how are NFTs impacting artist creation? How do you think it is? And um, are they impacting the process as well? Yes, they are. They are. The answer, I think, for me is, is definitely they are. Um, there was a good point there on your question, which is that code is allowing artists to do more with their art, but as well, uh, code is also allowing coders, so programmers, who are artists, to develop their art, which is a very interesting concept that we didn't have before. Before, the programmer was a full-time or a freelance job, professional, um, and that was it. Maybe he would play a lot of video games, maybe he would even develop some video games, freelance work, work for hire, uh, and now the programmer can actually sell NFTs of small video games. I bought several, I love them because they're just this dynamic NFTs that you can play, uh, things change, and some of them using smart contracts are actually dynamic, so the game changes when the developer wants to. And just taking this as a case, of course there are a lot of other types of artists, uh, oil on canvas, so physical painters, and all of them are using and abusing the code, the smart contract, the opportunities they have to make, uh, to establish a brand, to establish themselves in this space. But for programmers, uh, the gamification, the ownership, the authority that they can have, sorry, not authority, but the reputation they can have in the space, this is very important. And this is something that technology is allowing. We, historically speaking, we don't really know technology. I grew up with technology, most of us, well, all of us grew up already with technology, but technology is a very recent, very, very recent thing. We don't have technology in Christmas traditions or nothing like that because there just wasn't any. And all of a sudden we saw this growing into now Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. Now they say it's already Web 5 or it doesn't matter the number you give. This is technolog technological development. This allows us to create infrastructures that artists can use to prevail. Graphical, graphic designers, it's another example that I want to give just before I finish here. Graphic designers were also just freelance professionals. I worked as a graphic designer, freelance professional, in, while I was in university. I could do, you know, logos and ceremony invitations, birthday dinner, whatever it is, and that was it. Every creation I did using Illustrator, all these third-party tools that allows us to create and to, to give this experience, were kept to myself. And I know most graphic designers I knew uh, were doing the same. And NFTs allowed us to have a well-curated space and also to have your interest, our interest, the interest of people to actually want to look at it. And gaming designers, I think you might have a chance to talk about this, are again other type of profession that was raised and empowered because of technology, because of NFTs, but also, and just to remind everyone, it's because of us, because we brought well-curated marketplaces, we, we gave them interested, we put these artists on you know, screens, and this is very important because it's a synergetic work that we're doing. Yeah, that's it. No, super interesting. And, and on, on this regard, there's something, because I come from the um, cin cinema and, and all of this and audiovisual. And as you were saying, so there are artists in these industries that always have like a middleman, no? To do their art, they have to have a producer, no? People that do a film, for example. But now with NFTs, they can be themselves and, and, and put their art out there to people without having to be part of a movie, for example. They can still do it, but they can suddenly do these animations in short form that you can sell, uh, or games, as you were saying. No, th it, There's a lot of different type of artists in the world, um, and the technology allows you to, to actually show your art outside of your uh, 
workspace. Maybe we can talk about this in, in the gaming industry as well, how that has changed for the, for the creators in the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, in the gaming industry, we had a, for a long time, we have a role called the technical artist, which is fun. It's very appropriate because it's this person with artistic capabilities, so uh, she or he knows about lining and color, etc. And or modeling <coughs> or drawing, but it, but this person also is able to take this artistic part and make it work in the game, for example. And this requires a very specific technical procedures, like, for example, uh, you know, when when you play a game that all you can have many different clothes, for example, all of them have to be very specific so they fit well in your arms or they fit well on your on your character. And and then. To create this, uh, there are tools. We create a lot of tools, and now it's similar. For example, Web3, well, Web3 um, NFT collectors, you know, there's the classic, it's a lot of faces uh, with different hair, horns, hat, glasses. Okay, very questionable in my opinion, but, but these are done through tools. They build tools that allow to make uh, a huge amount of combinations based on five or ten different traits. So this is the combination of code and, and art that is happening. And also the AI <laughs> enters into the space. For example, in Agora, w one of the winners of the digital, um, digital animation, digital art, sorry, contest, uh, it was uh, an artist from Turkey who did something based on AI. So it's not that the AI did everything. Um, he was kind of guiding the AI towards whatever result he wanted, and it was the winner of, of the contest. So a lot of synergies are happening between technology and art, and as Maria said, uh, it's pretty cool that now artists can use coding, but now coders now can use <laughs> uh, tools to create their own art. And so, so this is basically what it does. It opens the, the all, all the audience that can get benefited from the NFT technology. No, yeah, super, super agree on this. And the artificial intelligence is also like a big uh, topic right now. And and maybe some people see it as controversial, etc. But as you said, it's a tool, right? It's not just a robot making art, and that's it. it it's an extra layer of the creative process, and and it can take you to different places, no, in in the artistic world. Um, so. I want to make the difficult question now. Uh, is it all just an illusion? Because <laughs> all of this is really good, but then you know the mainstream, everything that people see outside of uh, Web3 is, is all bad, it's a bubble, um, uh, it's all fake, um, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of speculation, et cetera. For example, there's something happening at the moment about royalties in the marketplaces as well. This is something that at least the people that is in, in the space and for artists, this was something uh, particularly interesting for artists because before royalties were um, an illusion <laughs> really. Uh, and with the technology now, you could have it, right? But now marketplaces seem to be cutting that out, which is uh, not great. Um, so the difficult question, is there room for real impact with the technology? And um, can innovation be stopped by these traditional systems that we have uh, in the world? Maybe we can start with you, whoever wants to answer. <laughs> it, it, I don't know if I can answer what is going to happen. My personal experience is that there has been a lot of bubble and hype and totally unsustainable stupidity. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But I think at the same time, the technology is totally valid. And as I mentioned before, the cool stuff still to come. I believe so. I'm not 100% sure, but here you have two examples of super good use of technology, for example, in, in not only for selling something and get money, but to help people through NFTs, use, using NFTs, using the technology as a tool to uh, achieve a, a bigger thing, a more important thing. So I think there is room. Um, as all technologies, in the 2000, the, the dot-com crash, you know, and people question the internet, but come on, internet stays here and it's important now uh, but it was difficult to say before the email before 
broadband, you know, when it was at this very, very early stage, it was difficult to predict how big it could become. So maybe I'm super optimistic, but I think this is kind of the same. It depends on the people in this room. What are you going to do with this technology? And then it will be big, uh, bubble or not bubble. Yeah, I think to, to add to that, um, in answer to a question, yes. <laughs> um, I think it can have an impact, and ultimately it is having an impact. Like Again, circling back to the, the point around the, the challenges of breaking into the traditional art space, the big issue is that there are gatekeepers. The, the middlemen exist, and on the one hand, if you're a consumer, then you would think that these people are there to kind of maintain a certain level of quality, but then in actual fact, you end up with all kinds of like tax evasion scams in like the modern art world, for example. Um, billionaires wanting a tax write-off, all of that fun stuff which you know is happening. And ultimately, systems, so be they traditional systems or the new systems that are now possible, um, seek to protect themselves. And if you're someone who is operating in one of the more kind of traditional and to a degree crystallized markets where there isn't that degree of flexibility, then things may become difficult from a regulatory standpoint. But if you're someone in on the African continent, for example, or if you're in Central Asia or in Southeast Asia, and these existing structures don't necessarily exist in the same way, then there is, although the existing structures haven't served you in some way, um, then you're going to be looking for alternatives. Um, you're going to be looking for new ways of doing things that are going to be able to deliver the value that you are looking for, deliver the impact that you are looking for. And I think that NFTs are a really interesting way to do that. Because as with blockchain and crypto, they facilitate the, the disintermediated transfer of value. With NFTs, you have the disintermediated transfer of social capital as well. You have a way of tokenizing culture to a degree. So if we think about the internet, for example, I'm sure everyone has a favorite meme from the internet. Um, Nyan Cat, I think you may have heard of it. It's from a good 12, maybe even longer than that, years ago. Um, and that was sold as an NFT last year. I think it went for close to half a million dollars. And it's like a, it's a rainbow Pop-Tart cat flying through space, hooping a rainbow with a really irritating song that once you hear it, it'll be going around in your head for days, weeks. Um, it sounds ridiculous, but what you have there is a way of tokenizing a piece of intangible cultural heritage. And it is an example of culture which is developing on the internet. And lots of cultural discovery and cultural growth is currently happening online. And there has been no way for people to get involved with and support that development of culture because there's been no way of verifying ownership, there's been no way of making sales, there's been no way of building a community which isn't being gatekept by individuals in the traditional art space or individuals in traditional finance. But now we have a way of making those digital assets something with true value that can be verified. And then things get really, really interesting because the, the applicability of NFTs and the use cases, like at the moment we've seen lots of digital art, like 400 different varieties of monkey picture, and everyone thinks that a bored ape that's facing left is going to be the next thing that's worth uh, half a million dollars because Snoop Dogg said that he bought one or Kim Kardashian said something. And this is interesting socially because you have this massive network effect that is coming. The value of the asset, I mean, I don't think I really need to say anything there, to be honest. <laughs> but as the technology matures as the understanding matures and as the the adoption increases in these places outside of your kind of traditional realms then ultimately i think the impact is potentially limitless because you're able to connect with people who would have otherwise be completely shut out you're able to apply it to charity initiatives um, supporting individuals who are from marginalized communities be that for learning difficulties or be that because of where they were born geographically or because they didn't receive the right kind of support or they didn't have access to the right kind of education with NFTs um, and the ability for creators to connect directly with their community and for the community to effectively take out 
equity in the development of this creator. Like you say, you see someone that you like, you buy a piece of their artwork, they do incredibly well 10 years down the line and you've got one of their like original pieces. A lot of people think that they're speculative. It's like, oh, there's no value to these things. How do you know what the value is going to be? But we're still so early and like that's a meme in and of itself. It's like, oh, we're all still so early at the moment. But we really are. And I think as things developed, the, the impact is going to be just absolutely huge, but it's, it's kind of a known unknown, right? It's still super early. We know that something is going to happen, but what that is going to be, that's anyone's guess. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, and I think, you know, speculation, bubble, and all of this is, is going to be there and more in this stage, as, as you say. But the good thing is that we can also be part of what the future is going to be, no? And, and maybe change it. So talking about future, um, what tendencies, which tendencies are you guys seeing uh, with the NFT space in the three sides? So artistic, technological, and social. Are there anything, any things that you're seeing more, more and more lately or the path that you're seeing where this could be going? Because we don't know where it's going to go, as we said, but maybe we see a little path somewhere. Maria, Ricardo. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, for sure, we're seeing a lot of new things. I, I would say maybe the three main aspects from, for me uh, as tendencies in the space are, for once, for sure, gamification. So the gaming industry was very underrated uh, until our technolo this technology came along. Um, decentralized uh, justice. Uh, this is something I came across only this year, and it's one of the tendencies that I see rising more uh, in the market, which is uh, when I started hearing about DeFi, decentralized finance, decentralized science, all of this, it became very clear what we're trying to do here. We're trying to rebuild something, which might work, it might be crooked, but whatever is built today, somewhat it will last, so we are participants of the future. Um, when it came to justice and decentralized intellectual property, which is what I work for, or the CC zeros, which are licenses to allow copyright from, uh, for NFTs or any other digital asset, um, taking the premise that justice is a base for is a human behavior, is something that we have intrinsically in us, we try to be fair, uh, and that law, although it's not always going side by side with justice, is still our way to communicate what we think is fair, so justice, um, then in that case, decentralized justice or decentralized intellectual property, licensing, anything that is related to law, is our way to rebuild a system that has been so old uh, so, for example, copyright law came in the 70s. It's not, uh, it's not used to, technologi to technology. It's not used to computer and digital arts. So we're trying to rebuild something, and I think that's one of the tendencies I see. And finally, the metaverse experience. I will always say that the metaverse experience is something that we're bringing, and we're bringing full power. The technology is not fully there yet, and maybe when we get to full augmented reality, we will see the true power of being educated by, you know, feeling colors and touching these colors and sensing them, perceiving them with sounds and other things. So I think for education, for gamification, for uh, a social experience, the metaverse is the biggest tendency that we will keep having in the space. Um, so there's two things that I find really interesting about future possibilities and, and trends with, with NFTs and um, from artistic side, it's put the potential to make people say wow. And I'm seeing that recently um, when the new technological trends cross paths. So using NFTs and combining them with artificial intelligence or with virtual reality experiences. Uh, one example that comes to mind is an artist I saw um, painting in virtual reality and then the painting he made that he shows recording himself, uh, the painting inside the virtual reality space is what becomes the NFT. So that potential to make people's jaw drop is something that's really inspiring for a lot of people. And also with artificial intelligence too. Um, another example I saw was um, somebody taking the Mona Lisa 
and then using Dolly, uh, going through the, f the picture frame and then being in the room that the Mona Lisa was in and using artificial, in artificial intelligence to, to fill in the gaps in the rest of the room. And these are the kind of technological tools that allow an artist um, to basically have the tools necessary to mm, affect their vision and the ability to inspire people. I think the the two interesting areas at the moment, to, the two points that you made around um, technology and the social side. Um, technology is an interesting one because if you look at the some of the biggest criticisms that the general public, someone who's not involved in the industry or NFTs have of the space as a whole is one, the, the speculative nature, like is it going to last? Is this something that is going to be worth something in the future? Um, and then also the concerns around the environmental impact. So when volume on OpenSea exploded and everything was taking place on the Ethereum blockchain, a lot of the criticisms that were revolving around NFTs were focused on the underlying consensus mechanism of Ethereum at the time, so proof of work. Um, very intensive from a carbon standpoint, but now the transition to proof of stake with the merge has gone through. That argument, I haven't seen that argument since because it's no longer an argument really. And I think this is a pretty good demonstration that the, the technology is adapting and changing to meet what the market is looking for, um, to, to meet people where they're at and to ultimately become more inclusive from an understanding standpoint. Um, from a political viability standpoint as well, because again, proof of work receives a huge amount of criticism worldwide. Biggest blockchain on the planet has now shifted to proof of stake. Crickets, no more criticism. So I think that trend is very encouraging because also technology at the moment, because we are so early, the user experience is poor. Like having to connect to a wallet and then connect to a marketplace and then authenticate and then connect and hope the transaction goes through and then finding it. it's just it's not a very user friendly experience at the moment and early adopters in the space don't mind they're willing to kind of experiment with things a little bit get something to work but the the average person who may be a collector or an art fan or find someone that they want to support but they don't have the the technical understanding or the inclination or the patience to do it which is absolutely fair enough um, they're going to be turned off by that at the moment and as the technology develops this will improve as well and then from that that's when I think the social impact starts happening because um, as the NFT space has kind of developed, we went from having the, the 10,000 PFP pictures that would anything sold out immediately, and then it became a case of, okay, like what is the utility that comes with this? And then they would launch a token, and then the token became like land in a metaverse. And then it's kind of gone back to utility, and I think utility and what some NFTs are capable of doing. And to be clear, like some NFTs don't need utility. Like if you're buying art from an artist and you want to support that artist, that's the utility in and of itself. The utility is being able to provide that artist with royalties and then ultimately sharing the revenue if you choose to resell it in the future. The utility for things like membership clubs or tickets or something like that, that's when I think things will start getting really interesting because you have communities and social groups that have an interest in maintaining provenance over their digital creations, main, making accessibility better for their community online, bringing people into physical spaces to interact with them. Um, and again, as the technology develops, the social applicability develops as well. And then you end up with this, again, because there's that disintermediated transfer of value that's happening. The network effects that you can create if you're looking to build a community or if you're looking to establish a presence or like personal branding, as it were. Um, that value can spread incredibly quickly because of those network effects. So I think everything will kind of like come together over time as the different areas of the industry start to mature. And then we'll, again, like we'll start seeing some really exciting stuff happening and the best is yet to come, I think. I'd like to add something. <coughs> um, I don't know if you follow Katie Wood. Katie, Katie Wood, it's uh, an investor from Ark Invest. It's a famous, Im she invested in Tesla and SpaceX. So. Um, and I read a report the other day, and she's betting, well, not her, her investment firm is betting on digital wallets. There is a big trend, uh, as talking about the future NFTs, uh, about the digital wallet. So, <coughs> sorry, if you consider that everyone has a cell phone now, and kids, or not so kids, like 15 to 20 years old, 
um, people just, you know, carry their mobile phone all times, like we do, but 20 years ago we didn't. But now everybody's carrying it all the time. And if you consider your wallet, what do you carry in your wallet? Your ID, your license, driver license, money, a couple of pictures from your family, I don't know. Think about everything you carry in your wallet today and imagine how is it going to be digital. So it's not all, all, all related to art, mm -hmm. to be honest. But I think the NFTs also bring this possibility. So you have your license card as the NFT because it's a proof of certificate that this is your license. Your tickets for a concert, which is already happening. There's some concerts already sell tickets through NFTs, etc. So basically, as a trend, as a social trend, it's going to replace your physical wallet in many ways. I like that. Uh, that but if you lose the phone, <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So for the last question, I think, and to, to join what you said as well and what you mentioned uh, about uh, the usability and the user experience, um, I think we can all agree that uh, NFTs are truly revolutionary and it can change a lot in the world. But for it to be more impactful, I think it has to go mainstream somehow. Um, so I wanted to know if you guys agree and if you do, how do you think it's going to go mainstream? in the future, whatever that means. Um, and then we can end with that. Um, I think gaming is going to help making it mainstream. Axie Infinity was the biggest uh, trading, sorry, trading marketing for, for some time. Now, n after that, the bubble just exploded and it went down. But it brings like 100 million players into the crypto world. And that's the power of, of, of gaming. It's, uh, it has appeal by itself. And yeah, but also obviously uh, it, a lot of barriers. There are a lot of clever people nowadays considering how to make it easy to access. Mm -hmm. Like how do you connect your wallet easily? How do you save all these three steps which are uncomfortable? Changing from Polygon to Ethereum to Solana. So uh, these barriers are going to go in lower and lower and low. And when, when this is like grandpa proof, there will be a, a mass adoption like the first kind of the first iPhone. You know, it's like you, you, you got it and you could immediately use it, basically. I agree. Um, I think we really need to improve the user experience. Um, maybe one point is we just need some top players in the market because before we, we were not about streaming. We, we saw Spotify, we saw Netflix, and that was the interest. The brands were the interest, not the streaming technology. That is for the people that are interested in technology, the programmers, the, the investors. So when we start branding cryptocurrency, blockchain technologies, Web3 and NFTs a little bit too harsh, uh, we're branding a technology and people feel more connected to, to brands and to what they bring to them. So it's about the experience. We need to improve the user experience and we need to show that the technology we're building makes sense, makes sense for whatever you, me, us want to see, to listen or to do. And that's the point where mass adoption occurs. And also, as you mentioned before, with you know, Snoop Dogg says he buys a board apes, everyone does. It's also a lot about reputation and power of influence. So if we do provide these interesting platforms that people want to use, and we bring these top players, this power of influence, then we will reach it. So we're not battling. This is not a battle against Web2. It's just if this technology really works, it will work for itself as long as we show them something. Uh, show us something, of course. Um, I agree with, with everything that uh, Ricardo and Maria have mentioned. Uh, I also th think that um, key for mainstream adoption um, is education and, and support for businesses. Businesses have infrastructures in the real world, and maybe there are lots of businesses who are on the edge and also want to dip their toes into these digital communities. Um, and maybe the support needs to be there for their ex first experience to be as positive as possible so that they want to continue down this path. 
And I also think um, adding to these communities with, with top players uh, is also really important to have fully inclusive digital communities. Um, the more inclusive these digital societies are, the more welcoming, welcoming they will be to the masses. And in the end, um, the sense of belonging is, is a fundamental human motive and everybody wants to feel like they belong to a community. So the more you make a community that is belonging to everybody, the more welcoming it is and the more diverse and rich this, these communities will be. Yeah, I think um, education is one of the things that I think is the most important at the moment because there's so much misinformation out there around what NFTs are, what they can do, how they work, who they apply to. Um, the, the, the average person, if they haven't taken the time to kind of strip away those first few layers of noise and understand what's going on, um, the barrier to entry is huge at the moment because to understand NFTs, you have to understand blockchain. And then that's a whole ball of hair in and of itself. I mean, to the complexity, there's the perception that because it's technology, it's technical, um, which again, puts some people off. So I think building out educational initiatives and platforms that help lower that barrier to entry that make things more accessible to more people um, will be incredibly powerful and fundamental to, to wider adoption. And then the second thing I think is use cases at the moment. Um, one of the, the big issues that I see in the, the crypto space, the blockchain space, the NFT space as a whole is it's very inward looking in the, a lot of the messaging and the marketing and the development, the product development is focusing on problems that crypto natives, NFT natives are experiencing. Um, a lot of the marketing is looking to take away from the share of the pie of someone else to increase the size of your slice, um, which is interesting. But if you think about the absolute number of people that are currently interacting with the technology, it's tiny. Very, very few people on a global scale uh, interacting at the moment. So I think as those use cases develop and if the, the industry starts looking more outward in terms of how can we solve problems that more people are experiencing as opposed to how can we solve problems that only people who know are experiencing, I think that will be another massive driver because ultimately there is far more value that can be created and shared if you're focusing on making the pie bigger as opposed to making your slice bigger. And with those things, I think we also then need to move, there will come a move away from cults of personality as well. Um, there are larger than life figures that exist in the industry. Um, I think with education and use cases, the, the influence that these individuals wield, um, which again can be quite off-putting to some people, will end up diminishing because you'll be able to, to see through the wall. So your, your Sam bankman frieds your Charles Hoskinsons, your Vitalik's, still important, infamous, famous, whatever your perspective may be. I think with education and use cases, the influence these individuals have diminishes. And then it stops feeling culty, because let's be honest, sometimes it does feel a little bit culty. Well, thank you very much, Ben, Haas, Maria, and Ricardo. Uh, I don't know if we have some time for questions. I think we've run out of time. Um, but we're going to be here, so if you want to ask us something, you can come directly to us. Um, and just wanted to remind you again that we have the exhibition of L'Art de Viure right there. Uh, check it out, and if you can, uh, support the cause for the Ampans Foundation. And we're going to see a little video if the tech guys can put it now in here. And, well, thank you very much, and thank you guys for being here. Yeah.